In May of 1996, 19-year-old Cal Poly freshman Kristen Smart attended a party. After walking home alone, she was never seen from or heard from again. The Sheriff's Department, police, even the FBI took part in the search for Kristen, but it never ended. She was presumed dead in 2002. Now, 26 years later, the last person to see Kristen alive, a fellow student, Paul Flores, and his father have been criminally charged in her death and disappearance. Tonight, we break down what we know about what happened to Kristen and look ahead to the trial of her accused killer. Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Ted Rollins in for Vinny tonight on Monday. The trial of Paul Flores and his father, Ruben Flores, is set to begin in Monterey County, California. Paul, who has been a prime suspect in the death and disappearance of Kristen Smart, has been charged with her murder. His father, 81-year-old Ruben Flores, has also been charged. He has been charged with being an accessory after the fact. This is a case that people have been following around the country for decades, and we're going to spend the next hour diving into it. But let's start with Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter. She has a look at how we got here. Kristen Smart was a 19-year-old college freshman at Cal Poly St. Louis Obispo when she vanished in May of 1996. She was last seen leaving a party with two other students. Kristen's disappearance has remained a mystery. Search warrants were executed in February of 2020, 24 years after she went missing. Police searched the home of Paul Flores, one of the students Kristen was last seen with, also searched were his parents' home in Arroyo Grande, California, and property in Washington State. Then police went back to look at Flores' home again. The searches appeared to be the break the Smart family had been waiting decades for. After years of calling Paul Flores a prime suspect, police finally arrested him for murder. His father, Ruben, arrested as an accessory to murder. Paul and Ruben Flores were arrested after investigators found biological evidence under Ruben's deck behind his home. According to the AP, there were traces of human blood and stains in the soil. The Smart family filed a lawsuit last April against Ruben Flores for severe emotional distress spanning nearly 25 years. It alleges Ruben relocated Smart's remains with the help of Paul's mother, Susan Flores, and her boyfriend, Mike McConville. Despite all of this, Smart's body has yet to be found. Wow, they're outside, there's a caution tape over there, and I'm like, this is real, there's, you know, I, I see police undercovers and I see you guys. I just pray for the Smart family and, and I pray that they, they get some finality to this. Kristen was pronounced legally dead in 2002, but this billboard with Kristen's face has remained a fixture on the California Central Coast since her disappearance, serving as a daily reminder of unserved justice. The distance between the last place she was seen alive and the door to her dorm building at Muir Hall is just about 40 yards. That's the voice of Chris Lambert on his podcast in your own backyard. It's a deep dive into Kristen's disappearance. The podcast renewed interest in the case and put pressure on authorities to solve it. On the walk back to her dorm, I think that Paul Flores took her instead to either his dorm or another location, attempted to sexually assault her, and I think that she lost her life in the process. Uh, Paul Flores, the defendant in Smart versus Flores, San Luis Obispo Superior Court case. Paul Flores has been the main suspect from the beginning, and he maintains his innocence. For years, the Smart family was frustrated with the local sheriff's department, but since a new county sheriff took over, things changed. Uh, we'll continue to focus on finding her remains, regardless of any court action. So we will continue the process of finding out where Kristen is. Uh, when I took office, uh, one of the first acts that I mentioned was re-examining, starting from the beginning. Besides the podcast, there was also an army of Facebook supporters keeping Kristen's story alive. I think the best thing that we can do for Kristen and her family right now is what Kristen supporters like doing the very least but have gotten really, really good at is just being patient and waiting. 
And that patient's paying off now, 26 years after Kristen Smart went missing on Monday. We are expecting opening statements to take place in Monterey County, California. The trial's been moved out of uh, the San Luis Obispo area down to Monterey because of the amount of not only publicity over the years, but just how this case has been ingrained in the people that live in the Central Coast. They know Kristen Smart, uh, they know the story, and uh, for that reason, the judge moved the case down to Monterey County. Joining us now is a person that knows this case as well as anybody. He's in San Luis Obispo, California, anchor Richard Gearhart, and he is with our great affiliate KSBY, uh, and, and that station, of course, has been covering it since Kristen first went missing. Uh, Richard, thanks for joining us, uh, and I would really appreciate your time here. I want to start with um, just give people a sense of how the Central Coast and Kristen Smart have been on this 26-year journey together. You know, I, I think that's uh, one of the interesting parts about this case, right? And we just heard that story. We saw uh, changes kind of through time, right? We get a new sheriff and he renews interest in it. We had a couple of students kind of uh, reinvigorate the case of Cal Poly and through student media. And then we get the podcast, which was one of the big main changes. And you also heard how those billboards have been up around town. So, you know, I was working at this station in um, 1996 when she went missing. I have been working here and covering the story for the entire 26 year span. And there has never really been a time. I mean, certainly there has been, you know, interest has waned a bit and then come back. There's never been one person who's really spearheaded this kind of interest. It's always just been on the community's mind. And I think it's been on the community's mind because uh, especially at the time, especially in 1996, things like that just didn't happen here. And so uh, there's just there's this really big push or this big desire to get this to some sort of resolution. And Paul Flores has always been the prime suspect. This is the individual who was with her the night that she went missing after leaving a, an off-campus party. Um, there have been some pre-trial motions leading up to trial. This is, this is an extensive trial. They're expecting it to last weeks. Two separate juries, one for Dad, one for Paul Flores. Um, let's go through some of the pre-trial um, rulings that this judge has made. It seemed to be pretty uh, favorable towards the prosecution, starting with the fact that uh, they, there was a, a motion to quash a subpoena for the defendant's mother. Uh, to be a potential witness, Susan Flores, she might be it. She might um, she might be part of this proceeding. Yeah, exactly. That was a motion they actually heard yesterday, and there was a whole series of these final motions that they were uh, going over, making final decisions on before moving forward with opening statements on Monday and Tuesday. Um, but yeah, she was uh, one of the you know one one of the items that the judge was considering was quashing that subpoena. They subpoenaed her as a witness uh, under the idea that, you know, that she might incriminate herself and, and that wouldn't be fair to her. But the judge said, no, she can go forward and testify. And so, you know, it remains to be seen if she actually testifies, but there were a number of decisions like that. You know, there was a request to, to keep some of that more recent DNA evidence that was discovered under the homes um, out of evidence. And uh, of course, the big one that was decided today was whether or not that podcaster, Chris Lambert, would be testifying in the trial as well. So yeah, there were a, a, a number of decisions today that, that did you know, sort of um, land, I would say, a bit more on the prosecution side. We've seen podcasters uh, attack stories, unsolved stories with new eyes, fresh eyes. And in this case, Chris Lambert, um, he lived in the area, drove by the billboard all the time. And then one day said, who is this Christian Smart? And, he, and, he, and that was the beginning point. And by the end of it, he really did move the ball, did he not, to reinvigorate the interest and possibly ramp up some pressure. And I know the new sheriff made a big difference too here, um, but talk about how just the new interest, you referred to it earlier with the Cal Poly students and Chris Lambert, how it was a real game changer for the Smart family because they've been waving their hands for 26 years uh, and all of a sudden the, this next generation of, of kids took the ball and ran with it. Yeah, and you know, I, I think that's kind of interesting about this case too, to be honest with you. Um, Kristen Smart, the Smart family, is from Stockton, California. That's several hours to the north. She was a Cal Poly student for one academic school year, didn't quite finish the school year. So there isn't a big connection with her and her family here on the Central Coast. But for some reason, this really does pique the interest of residents who live here in the San Luis Obispo area. And whether that's from uh, 
Cal Poly students who have been more recently attending Cal Poly, or even, you know, in the case of Chris Lambert, just, you know, be interested in this case and, and really just that desire that I talked about to have some sort of resolution to sort of solve this case to find out where she is. And obviously, we're not sure that that's going to happen. There, there's never been a body discovered. You know, there's really no smoking gun here. There's no, uh, you know, uh, evidence that, that we know of so far uh, that, that really is a turning point in this case. But what he was able to do is, is really sort of refocus. And I, I think one of the things that's interesting to talk about, right, is over the last over the last 26 years, technology has really changed. So one of the things that you mentioned in your recap package was the fact that there's this social media, this Facebook page that really uh, looks at evidence and um, continues to sort of bring these things up. And the podcast is another, you know, podcasts are new, uh, obviously, over the last 26 years. And and I don't, I think he was kind of surprised by that. You know, he, he really wanted to start this podcast. He wanted to kind of dig a little more deeply and he came up with witnesses you, you know we've um, done interviews with sheriff ian parkinson who said there were new witnesses discovered there was new evidence discovered through that podcast that then they were able to sort of look at and use that to get additional search warrants and so you know when we say the new sheriff he obviously was elected in, in 2011 so he's been the sheriff for a while but that was almost one of his campaign um uh, slogans, if you will, you know, that he was going to look at these cold cases, including the Kristen Smart case, and, and sort of not give up on that. And, and he actually appointed an investigator that was really just supposed to be looking at cold cases. And when we saw these witnesses come forward in the podcast, that did change some things. You know, one of them was a big topic of discussion in court today during those motion hearings. Uh, uh, a, a lady by the name of Jennifer Hudson, who claims on the podcast that she uh, heard Paul Flores talk about getting rid of or burying the body. And so that's that's the big topic of conversation. You know, does Chris Lambert need to take the stand? Is there, uh, is there um, some reason to compel cross-examination? And so that was one of the things that they were really looking at, this new evidence that came forward in his investigation. And one of the things that's probably worth talking about, right, is that in this podcast, in his investigation, it's it's a podcast, right? So he may not have been following traditional sort of journalistic approaches to his investigation and maybe not law enforcement approaches to his investigation, but he did come up with, with really evidence that sort of kind of reinvigorated this desire to sort of solve this case. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it, uh, and, and you sort of touched on it earlier. There is no big smoking. It's not as if they walked into the Flores home and said, oh, here we go. We've, we found the body or we... There, this is still a very circumstantial case, and for people to think, okay, well, they got him, he's going down, uh, they, we're going to have to watch this play out because this is not a slam dunk by any stretch of the imagination for uh, the, the DA's prosecuting. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's certainly not as a journalist my uh, job to sort of predict what's going, what, what's happening or, or what will ultimately happen in the case. But I was sitting in court on Monday of this week listening to jury selection uh, for the jury. And as you mentioned, there's two separate juries, right? So this particular jury selection was for Ruben's jury, the father's jury. And uh, the prosecutor, Chris Pavrell, was really talking about this idea of, you know, as jurors, are you going to be able to look at circumstantial evidence? Are you going to be able to to infer from the evidence that we do have what, what may have happened beyond a reasonable doubt? He was really questioning jurors about that because really there is no big evidence. You know, we've seen uh, since the sheriff was elected to office, I think we've seen something like 18 search warrants since 2011 served, 91 additional witnesses either interviewed or re-interviewed uh, once he sort of took over the sheriff's department and got his investigators. Uh, looking at the case again. And so, you know, we've seen uh, really digs. You know, we've seen um, excavators go up to the Cal Poly hillside and dig in some of the dirt up there by what's called the Cal Poly P, where it's kind of a, hike, a popular hiking trail. And we've seen excavations under the, the two different homes that the Flores family owns, his mom in one of those houses and his dad in the other house. So we've seen those, you know, we, we've seen warrants, we've seen excavations, we've seen uh, law enforcement got on his San Pedro home in Southern California and his sister's home in Washington. But so far, we haven't seen anything that at least that's been released that is that's a really big new piece of evidence. Yeah, and, and then there's a huge anticipation for Monday and the opening statements because we'll get a real guide from what the state has and as they tell the jury that the evidence that they believe uh, is is going to um, be presented. This case was moved. Um, makes sense to for it to have been moved because of the interest in it. 
of no cameras in the case down in Monterey County. Uh, what is the interest in uh, the Central Coast area, San Luis Obispo area, as we're going to trial there? I can't imagine. People must be just um, scrambling for any detail that comes out of that courthouse. Yeah, and I think they always have, right? So we've certainly covered uh, the story all along. Every, every time there's a new piece of uh, evidence or a new search warrant that's issued, we're covering the story. Our audience is, is very much interested in in what's going on. And, you know, I, I think it's kind of a good point. It was I was thinking about this when we were watching uh, some of that background or piece, too. You know, my, my own son, my son, was born in 1996, right? And so he's 26 years old, and he grew up in this area. And one of the, the points that, the, that um, the defense was making in terms of requesting that that trial be moved is that really this case is almost part of the culture here if you will you know there's my son grew up looking at the billboards and listening to the news coverage and certainly I think a lot of the people who live here are really intensely familiar with the case and that was you know that was obviously the reason for moving it in order to make sure that there was uh, they were able to seat an impartial jury and get a fair trial but it really is kind of ingrained if you will kind of in the culture both through the Cal Poly culture and really through the um, the interest just in the surrounding community yeah and it is fascinating it is a cloud over that uh, over the area and as you mentioned the smart family is not from there it is and they and Kristen was only there for a short period of time it's the idea that this could happen here in this beautiful spot of the country and at a, at a uh, an institution like Cal Poly and the mystery of what happened to her? What happened to her? Obviously, uh, the community still gripped to it. Rich is going to stick around with us, and we're going to get a break in here. When we come back, we'll have much more on the disappearance of Kristen Smart. Before we go, here is a look at what's coming up next hour on Closing Arguments. Tonight on Closing Arguments in Toledo, Ohio. Shantae Harden standing trial for operating a phony funeral home. Today, emotional testimony from the mother of one of the decedents. I wouldn't have never gone with you if I'd have known that you were who you are. I cannot grieve. I can't grieve. My son is gone. I can't grieve. Dbeauty.com. open the door I'm like holy like you know wow they're outside there's a caution tape over there and I'm like this is real there's you know I, I see police undercovers and I see you guys and I was like this is the real deal and then I started reading and, and yeah it was true that was a neighbor of Ruben Flores back in March of 2021 when a search warrant was served at the Flores home using cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar to search under the lower deck of their house in Arroyo Grande, California. Archaeologists reported finding an anomaly in the ground under the deck. And according to court documents, the anomaly was approximately four by six feet, giving it the size requirements to be big enough to be potentially a burial site for a human body. And in the soil in this anomaly appeared to have been disturbed. The archaeologists concluded, quote, the hole had been excavated and something removed. A month after the search warrant, Paul Flores was arrested and charged with murder and his father charged with accessory after the fact. Still with us, anchor at our affiliate KSBY, Richard Gearhart is with us. And joining the discussion, some great investigators give us some insight. In Los Angeles, retired FBI Special Agent Bobby Chacon and in Salt Lake City, Private Investigator Jason Jensen. Gentlemen, uh, welcome to the conversation. Uh, Richard, we were uh, talking last segment about um, all of the, the pretrial motions, et cetera, uh, and some of that is going to be this archaeological and data experts that are going to come in, and, and the judge is saying, bring them in, even though the defense um, is basically saying, no, this is not uh, reliable science. Right, you know, and the judge Jennifer O'Keefe decided in, during these um, the, the trials today that you know there is uh, that 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 type of evidence has been uh, entered before into court cases, and so there is some background for archaeological digs for identifying these anomalies that you were talking about. Um, I, you know, I think probably one of the things to point out though is that I'm sure investigators and you've got some other people on the panel here. You know, we're hoping to find more than just an anomaly or more than you know they they do say that they found traces uh, of human blood as identified by DNA, but they didn't find a body, they didn't find bones, they didn't find clothes, there's a bunch of things that, as far as we know, they didn't find.
fine. But yeah, Jennifer o O'Keefe, the judge, the Superior Court judge, said all of that is admissible, that those expert uh, witnesses can testify in this case. Bobby, uh, when you, you're down in L.A. a few hours south, um, and this case has been in, um, you know, in the news in California for, for decades, what, sure. what, what do you think um, of the evidence that is, is being brought to trial? Without a body, this is going to be tough, is it not, to get a conviction? And, um, you know, we don't want to go back and say that there were all these missteps. But we will, because let's face it, 26 years ago, there was um, there was interest in in the suspect that is now standing trial. What stands out to you, um, the things that typically you would need to get to this spot to trial that aren't there? I guess a body's number one. Well, yeah, I mean, you always want a body, right? But more and more, uh, we're seeing cases move forward without a body because you never want to you would never want a defendant to benefit from being really good at getting rid of a body, right? You don't want that to happen. So you want to be able to move forward with these cases. What's what's really struck me about this case is the persistence. Every couple of years, we've kind of had a flurry of activity on this case. Back in 2016, there was some things happening, and then it seems to quiet down. And then a couple of years later, you know, you have a flurry of it. So the fact that the investigators stuck with this case and they've been trying everything they possibly can, and I will say this, that I've worked with prosecutors. Prosecutors do not move forward on a case like this unless they're confident they have enough to convict a trial. Prosecutors do not like to lose murder cases. And 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 they know they only get one shot. With double jeopardy, you get one shot at a defendant like this. And so I think that in this case, whatever they have, maybe we know some of it, maybe we don't know all of it, they have enough that they feel confident that they're gonna be able to get a conviction or else they wouldn't be moving forward. Jason, when you're an investigator in a case like this, this is a case that has haunted the central coast of California, but for the ones working on it who believe that Flores is the guy, it has to be a complete nightmare. It had to have been that those 26 years. Um, how difficult it is, is it when you know you got them, you just don't have the goods? Um, and, and what keeps you uh, sort of up at night? Right, right. Just like Bobby was saying, this case went from a cold case to active, back to cold again. And really the biggest problems that, you know, we all really sense here as we're preparing for trial, no body, no crime scene, no smoking gun, no cause of death. It, it sounds like there's really a lot in favor of the defense, but now, you know, you've introduced technology. We got, you know, the blood evidence from the ground. Uh, we know from, past experience, you can actually extract DNA from blood in soil. So how much of this is really going to pinpoint the fact that it's conclusive that there was a body under Ruben Flores's deck versus how much of this was really just supported by innuendo and, and a need to convict somebody that was a person of interest from day one? Yeah, if it's just a hole that uh, looks like it might have been a hole uh, that was four by six, Ah, uh, that's interesting, but it's not going to get you a conviction. Richard, the story is also a huge part of this case. The story of what happened that night, the story of, of Paul Flores. And there's going to be some witnesses that come on that the judge is allowing, some females that say that he um, acted inappropriately while they were inebriated. Um, what, what can you tell us about that sort of storyline that the state is going to try to project to this jury that Paul Flores is the guy and look, look how he acted with these people. You know, I, I heard somebody say not too long ago that that's, that that's a, a big part of the case, right? Is this sort of character assessment that the jury is going to look at the evidence, but they also look at the character of the person involved. And so the, he has had some run-ins with the law. He was, uh, he did have uh, an, a DUI arrest not too long ago. He has had these other people come forward and accuse him of, uh, sexual aggression toward them. Now, some of that was actually blocked today. Not all of that will be admitted, but some of it will be admitted. And so that was kind of a, a mixed decision from the judge today. But uh, yeah, and, and there was actually, uh, during the preliminary hearing, this request to, to sort of move forward with also uh, potentially charging him with rape during the commission of this alleged murder. And, and that was not allowed to move forward during the preliminary part of the hearing either. Uh, Bobby, when you, you have a theory, you're an investigator, you're, you're looking at this and, and you think you know what happened, you're not getting any cooperation from the suspect. Um, how difficult is it to really go with your gut and know that you're right when you don't have that 
<laughs> that evident, you know, the whole thing, the whole picture. What, how difficult it is, how frustrating is it when you we're involved in a case like this? Well, I mean, obviously, it's it's very frustrating. I'm sure some of the initial investigators are long retired by now when you have a case that goes this long. When you retire and you have something like this unsolved, you take it with you into retirement, and, and it becomes very frustrating, um, especially when you know you have the guy. Like, this was, he was a suspect from almost day one, right? He's the last person seen with her and stuff. So, you know, it was just an, an accumulation of, they would get a piece but not enough and then they would get another piece and it's still not enough and so i'm sure it's been very frustrating but the, the the perseverance of these investigators and of the sheriff down there and of the people really impresses me and i think that it, it i think this evidence while there's not a a smoking gun per se i think they've got a, an accumulation of evidence on all of these different aspects of the case that they feel taken in total is going to um you know uh win the day with the jury yeah, tell that story uh, to the jury and to the point where they can uh, and achieve a conviction. That's the goal for prosecutors. Richard Gearhart, KSBY anchor, uh, thank you so much for your valuable time. We'll be uh, checking in with you hopefully throughout the trial. I know you'll be a very busy man over the next uh, weeks and months as this all plays out. Our investigators are going to stick around. Uh, when we come back, more on this 26-year investigation into the disappearance of Kristen Smart. That's next. Four zero three three seven. The charge against Paul Flores is murder. It is alleged that Mr. Flores caused the death of Kristen Smart while in the commission of or attempted rape. That is first degree murder under California law. Reuben is charged with accessory after the fact to murder. The allegation against Reuben is that he helped to conceal Kristen's body after the murder was committed. Decades after Kristen Smart was reported missing in San Luis Obispo, California, her accused killer and his father are set to stand trial on Monday. Let's get back to look at how we got here. May 25th, 1996, Kristen Smart leaves a party with Paul Flores and two other students. Paul and Kristen end up splitting away from the other two to walk back towards their dorm rooms. This party was just off campus. Paul would tell investigators that he walked her as far as his dorm room and then let her go alone. Friends say she had been drinking that night. On May 28th, two days later, a missing person report is filed for Kristen with campus police. In June of 1996, the San Luis Obispo County District Attorney's Office interviews Paul Flores. The following year, the Smart family files a wrongful death lawsuit against Paul Flores. He cites the Fifth Amendment during the deposition. In May of 2002, Kristen Smart is declared legally dead. In September of 2016, law enforcement officials dig up three locations on a hillside where Kristen was last seen alive, but only animal remains were found. In March of 2021, cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar are used to search Ruben Flores' property. And then in April, the next month, 25 years after Kristen disappeared, Paul and Ruben Flores are taken into custody. Still with us, retired FBI Special Agent Bobby Schiavone and private investigator Jason Jensen. And Jason, when you look at that timeline, um, the thing that prompts the arrest apparently is this archaeological analysis and the, the ground penetrating radar. Um, it, 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 what's your first in instinct when you, when you uh, hear that, and, and maybe there's more there that we don't know, because I, I, I do know that the Flores, they were under surveillance for years, so there's probably more, but what, what's your first instinct when you hear that timeline and, um, and it goes from checking out the house to arrest? Well, it really just follows some basic common sense. What they did was they had cadaver dogs that alerted to under the deck, and then they used something less intrusive than digging. You know, they used the ground penetrating radar to see if there's any anomalies under the ground, which it read, it detected that there was density changes as if there was, you know, something dug and the, the soil was replaced. So. That's usually characteristic of a once upon a time, uh, anyone that's familiar with a clandestine grave that at some point or another, 
the remains of the body had been removed and then the soil replaced. So when you get cadaver dogs and you have archeological anomalies such as that, it really is gonna be an alert to law enforcement in a murder investigation if somebody had a body there at one, one point or another. Bobby, you could hear the defense attorney saying, though, are you kidding me? Just because it's four by six, now there's a body there? Um, it could have been anything. Sure, but Ted, normally this kind of evidence is not introduced in a vacuum. So hypothetically, if you have a, a witness come in and say, well, he told me he moved the body, or if they overheard him, you know, they at one point they were listening in on his cell phone or they were monitoring his text, if he texted with his dad, and they have other evidence that indicates you know, the body was there at one point. Then they do a dig and they come up with a small amount of biological material that they can say was human remains. That kind of corroborates what your other witnesses or other evidence is saying. So it's gotta be taken as part of, as you said earlier, the story that the prosecution is gonna walk the jury through. None of these things are gonna be taken in a vacuum. They're all going to kind of add, hopefully add pieces to this story that the prosecution is going to build. Now, during the original investigation into Kristen's disappearance, cadaver dogs and their handlers searched the dorms at Cal Poly, and court documents say that one of the dogs alerted on Paul Flores' dorm room back in June of 1996, just a month after her disappearance. According to court documents, it reads that the dog pawed at the door, smelled the bottom of the door, and brought the brinksel, the item, the in, you know, the alert item, back to the handler. Inside the room, the dog went to the far left corner, she pawed and smelled the corner and actually picked up the garbage can and brought it to the handler. The dog then went to the bed frame on the left side, which did not have a mattress, and continued to sniff around the frame. The document goes on to say that the handler learned that the mattress had been removed from the left side of the dorm room. Uh, it, one of the parts of this storytelling, um, Jason, is going to be the fact that the two days after Paul Flores' mattress is missing from his dorm room. Uh, why would a kid get rid of his mattress? You know, college kid, it, it, it'd take a lot to get rid of a mattress for a college kid. Uh, they live in some, you know, interesting conditions. And yet here he is, uh, two days after Kristen's disappearance, the mattress is gone and the dog alerts. First question, do you take dog handling evidence um, seriously, where where are you? Because people have different opinions on it, on a, a dog alerting. Well, considering uh, dogs have natural instincts and then the handler works at training to cultivate the particulars of what a dog would react to, to like, let's say human remains and make it more pro pronounced. So like they'll do a final training response when it is specifically related to the decay of a human. So it's possible, but I think like Bobby was alluding to earlier, when you corroborate with the fact that um, the mattress was replaced, it kind of gives their more credibility to the dog's behaviors because like you were saying, Ted, a minute ago, uh, I can imagine that you know people come and go through dorms many, many times before someone decides to replace a mattress, but you happen to replace one in between the time that a, a, a classmate goes missing and they're looking for her, that seems to be a red flag in most cases. Yeah, and you were the last person to see her. and She was drunk on the night leaving that party. Uh, uh, Bobby, what's your take on, on dog evidence and, uh, and how significant do you think the mattress piece is to this puzzle? Well, for many years, I would work on a drug squad in New York City. My partner was an FBI dog handler. And so we had the dog in our car all the time. He sat between our desks. I worked with that dog, it was a drug dog. I'm a big believer in, in the ability of dogs to do what they've trained properly to do. Um, and, and we lived with that dog for years. Um, and so uh, I do think that this is very important evidence. And I believe they brought in, as they often do, backup dogs to actually confirm the first dog. And, and so you have kind of, you know, one dog confirming what another does and they act separately. And even in that, that trash can that the dog had picked up, um, they then brought, I believe that, that can out and put it with other cans in a hallway and brought the dog by them. And he still alerted just to that one can. 
um, that was in the room. And so there's a lot of ways to kind of piece this together. And again, as Jason said, this is all part of a narrative. Any of these taken independently on its own, sure, you can pick apart. But this is going to be a narrative that the that the prosecution walks the jury through. And at the end of the day, when there's so much of this stuff, and I know it's called circumstantial evidence, and people think that it's not as strong and it's not as persuasive. But at the end of the day, when you have all of these things adding up, Remember, it doesn't have to be any doubt. It just has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Absolutely. We're going to watch this all play out starting on Monday. Our Chanley Painter is uh, headed to California. She's going to be in the courtroom reporting for us uh, every day on this trial. And a lot of interest uh, is going to come from this. We want to thank Bobby Shakota and Jason Jensen. Uh, gentlemen, have a wonderful weekend. Really appreciate uh, your time and your expertise on a Friday night, when we come back, body language expert Janine Driver, she's gonna analyze Paul Flores. Ooh, she knows what people are thinking, and we're gonna hear what she's thinking about the defendant. Stay with us. On the docket tonight in Broward County, Florida, the Parkland school shooter getting ready to face a jury who will decide if he lives or dies. We have a preview of the penalty phase for Nicholas Cruz. I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. Um, I'm resigned to it going either way. Now. Uh, I want to state for the record that, uh, so that it's clear as, uh, as you begin, that uh, other than confirming uh, Paul Flores's name, he does not intend to answer any questions and on my advice will invoke the Fifth Amendment on all questions. In 1997, the family of Christian Smart filed a wrongful death civil lawsuit against Paul Flores, which resulted in Paul and his father Reuben sitting for depositions. Now, as you saw there, Paul invoked his Fifth Amendment right during 99% of that deposition didn't answer any questions, but it was recorded and we can watch it. So tonight we're going to bring in our body language expert. She can read what people are thinking, even though they're not talking. So let's bring her in. She's in Wells, Maine tonight. Uh, she is not only a body language expert, but she is New York Times bestselling author of You Can't Lie to Me. Janine Driver's back with us. Janine, always great to see you. Um, yeah. Nice to see you. You can also check her out on TikTok at Body Language Institute. G uh, so let's um, do this. Let's take a look at um, some of this Paul Flores deposition back in 1997. So this is a while ago. Uh, and let's see what you pick up. Raise your right hand, please. Do you do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this matter should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes. Uh, would you state your full name for the record, please? Paul Ruben Flores. And what is your date of birth, sir? 10 22 76. What is your president, uh, present residence address? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Did you report uh, your 85 Nissan truck stolen in San Diego recently? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. In May of 96, were you a student at Cal Poly? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Uh, please provide me with the uh, employment positions that you have held since uh, you started high school. On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Are you presently employed? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Where do you presently reside? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Where did you attend high school? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. What is the name of your father? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. What is your mother's name? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. What is your sister's name? On the advice of my attorney, 
I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Does your mother have a sister? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Uh, prior to moving to the Arroyo Grande area, where did you reside? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, were you employed at Garland's in Grover Beach at any time in your life? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Have you ever been employed uh, at a Union 76 station in the San Luis Obispo County area? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. What is the name of your, your supervisor, strike that, what was the name of your supervisor at Garland's? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. What were the nature of your job duties at Garland's? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Did you cook hamburgers at Garland's? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. How old are you? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Uh, in what year? All right, Janine. All I heard was the same thing. What did you see? Okay, Ted, first to start off, I want, I want you to think that you, it, to the average person, you probably didn't see much. It looks like he's frozen. It looks like it's the same. But the difference between boiling water and not boiling water is one degree. All we need is this one degree, this tiny little movement, and that we see those tiny little movements here, this, this little bit of a boiling over. Now, we see this stiffness, but right out of the gate, what we see with Paul is he does this little tongue jut. And this tongue jut is, oops, I'm busted. Oops, I'm, I'm going to get away with this. So it's either or. It's either I'm busted or I'm going to get away with it. But we see this little tongue come out right after he swears himself in. He takes the oath. Then, this is very interesting. I'm curious about the mother's sister, because when he's asked about the mother's sister, Ted, what we're seeing here is this. He does this little bit of a snarl, and he shows us his teeth. And this teeth bearing typically is, I got caught doing something I shouldn't have done. So it makes me wonder if his mother's sister maybe doubts him or maybe knows some information that might be valuable to the case that's about to be in, in front of the jury. So we see some of these movements also with his head tilted. Granted, he is looking off to his right reading, but he keeps this head tilted to his right the whole entire time. And here's the deal, Ted, and you at home. There's something called REA, and it's called right ear advantage. When stress is high and our cognitive thinking is through the roof or there's a lot of happening around us, we hear more and retain more and process more with our right ear. So this is important. If you're ever in a meeting and there's a bunch of other noise, listen with your right ear, unless you have ear problems with that right ear. So it's called REA. And in the old days, back in the 60s and 70s, we thought it just goes from the age of five for little kids learning new things with this cognitive overload to the age of 13. But just in the last couple of years, Ted, what we've discovered with research is this continues as we get older. It does deteriorate a little bit. So this right ear angled towards his attorney is very interesting to me. It's the whole time it's saying what my attorney has to say is more important than the questions that you're asking me. So pay attention and you're in a crowded room or stress is high and you've got a lot going on, mm. internal dialogue and people are talking. Do you lend your right ear? I bet you you do. Yeah, well, I just got myself doing it to you while you were telling us all about it. Uh, um, it's always fascinating to listen to Janine analyze something that seems innocuous. Um, thank you, Janine. Enjoy your time in Maine there. Um, thanks for thanks, checking in with us and giving us uh, the, uh, the info, what we don't see. Back with more right after this.